and and prophesy a little bit about um, a dream, two dreams that I had last night. And so I, I, I'm really going to just um, interpret my dreams as we go here because we're in this season where God is speaking through dreams. We're at the very end of that season where God has really set time aside to speak through dreams. And um, I had two dreams last night about Andy. And honestly, I don't dream about Andy a whole lot. Nothing against him. I just He's just not in a lot of my dreams. I don't, I don't have... Ex- my dreams are already come true, right? Yeah. But there, were, I had two dreams last night that, that he was in, and one of them was interesting. I haven't, I just told him a tiny bit, so I didn't tell him a whole lot. Um, but in one of the dreams, he kept coming into the room where I was sitting, and he was carrying um, a, a Bible, not the one that you have here, not the one you have at home, but this different Bible, and you were more gray, he had gray, but, you know, he still had hair. I yeah, know, he's always like, as long as I have hair, I do not care what color it is. Um, but, yeah, your hair was a little more gray, and you had glasses on. And you kept putting your glasses on, kept putting your glasses, and you take them off, and you put them back on. And I'm just like, when did you get glasses? And I was like, this is... And so, anyway, it just kept going back and forth. So I was just really pondering that this morning because I just keep feeling like the Lord is saying our vision is very important for 2020. The way we see things, the way we hear things, and the way we look at things is very, very important. And so I really feel like the dream that I had about Andy having glasses on last night was very key for us as a body because, you know, he kind of leads us here. So that's why I'm I'm saying these things publicly. It's not because, oh, I think I had a great dream and you should all hear about it. I think, yes, it has to do with him, but it has to do with us. And so he had these glasses on, and I was like, where did you get glasses and again, I just think there's something about, and also the gray hair and all of those things speak of wisdom. And, and the word that, that he was carrying, the Bible he was carrying, was a gigantic Bible, and I could see the words from across the room. So the vision got clearer and clearer. The word of the Lord became more and more clear. And, and so that is very, very important to us in this next season. We have to know what the Lord is say, saying. And you know what? He's going to show us. And I felt this morning when we were looking, I was just pondering some of these things, and I hadn't talked to Andy about any of it, but I said, I was just pondering with the Lord. And the way we see things can be very skewed, or we think we see things that we don't see. Or we think we, we interpret things the way they weren't supposed to be interpreted in what we see. So the point is we must see clearly. We must see clearly, and we need to see very clearly so that we can have the strategy to walk through what we're supposed to walk through. Because the next dream I had, Andy, or Dusty, had taken Andy hunting on a boat in the ocean. I don't know. It was really strange. But Leviathan, (laughs) stop it. So anyway, so this is really strange because I kept pondering it this morning and just asking the Lord because what happened was they took this big boat and I knew that they were in the ocean. I knew that they had gone across the ocean. But I was standing on where, you know, you dock the ships, all that. I'm, I'm standing at this pier and I'm waiting for them to come back because Dusty had let me know, I'm bringing him back. He has to have a shot really fast. I'm like, okay. So hurry, I'm, I'm going to wait for you. I'm meeting you. And so as soon as they get there, I take Andy next door to the clinic, which is next door to the ocean, apparently. And they, I was like, he just needs this shot so he can go. He has to go. They're waiting for him. He needs this shot. And they're like, well, you need to fill out this paperwork, and you need to do it because we got to do your insurance. I said, I'm going to give you cash. Just give him the shot. He's got to go. And so I'm just pondering these things this morning. And um, I really feel like we have to have the strategy because when you're going across the ocean on international waves in a boat, which speaks of ministries, with a key person in the church, the pastoral team is waiting to drive you across the ocean, hunting, I don't know what for, you have 
to do things in order and you have to be prepared. They had to come back to get the shot that he needed. And if we would see properly and hear clearly and have the strategy, he would have had the shot first, therefore not having to delay and come back. So I don't know about you, but we as our family in this church are going to be listening and looking for the strategies of heaven because we have, you know, and this morning God just spoke to me, faithfulness is everything. If you're going to check out a little, still be faithful, you know. Maybe I can't do everything I was doing, and I'm not, and I'm not really checked in with the Lord perfectly. But just be faithful. Just show up. Just show up. You know, there there have been many days this last month. I'm just, I'm here. God, where are you? Show up. He shows up. We have to be faithful, and, and He's giving clear vision, and the strategies so that we can cross the ocean, carrying what we're supposed to carry. Amen. All right. Yeah, that's all new to me. I think maybe that means we need to take a church cruise. I don't know. So, what do you What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, it would be fun, right? All right. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's make our offering declaration. Let's stand together and let's declare these things together as a body, as an intercessory group of people declaring the word of the Lord over our lives and over the city. So let's uh, make this together. Heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declaration, impartation, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions, and promotions to go to the nations. Souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revival. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven to see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen. So we give in worship, in obedience. Thanking the King of Kings for his faithfulness, his goodness. And thank you guys for your faithfulness and your obedience, your generosity. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, at this time, let's dismiss our kids to go to their program. Hallelujah. God is doing good things. Praise God. Hallelujah. Some are excited, some maybe not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, happy birthday to many people. A lot of people had birthdays. Lisa Phillips, who is not in here. Lisa, she's leaving. She's doing the Miss America way. Lisa Knox had a birthday. Alan Rudd had a birthday. Nora had a birthday. If you had a birthday in, over the last week and a half or so and I missed it, raise your hand. Some won't admit to it. All right. So, praise God. Well, happy birthday. I trust everybody had a great, uh, great um, holiday season. We are in our new house, kind of. It's a, it's a process, but we've slept there three times, right? So, uh, hallelujah. So, God's good. Now, today, just as, and those were, I hadn't heard all that that Jamie shared this morning, but, um, you know, I wanted to preach today about preparing for a decade of harvest, Amen. And uh, I believe, and we've had prophetic words about this, and I believe it's true for the body of Christ that uh, the next decade will be the greatest and the most fruitful we've ever experienced. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy or tiptoe through the tulips or life as usual in the kingdom, but I believe it will be a very, very fruitful time for all of us in our lives and in the kingdom. And so, just yesterday, even in the last couple of days, I was, I was listening again uh, to some of the prophetic words uh, that Charlie Champ gave us this summer, okay? And, I th and you guys know, if you've been a part of this body, that uh, we take, especially from, from proven prophetic voices, 
and especially someone like Charlie Shamp, who's an internationally known and internationally proven prophet, that we, uh, the word says that if, if you listen to the prophets, you will prosper. Who wants to prosper? Right? We, we all should. That's why we get excited about a new year, right? Because after Christmas, we're ready to prosper. <laughs> Right, <laughs> we need to prosper, but I think if we if we pay attention to what the Lord is saying, principles in His Word, things He's speaking to us out of His Word and by His Spirit, then God will direct our paths and lead us and give us strategy. So, when we're getting new strategy, I think it's a very important to pay heed to the strategy that's already been given to us. Right? Many of us have prophetic words in our life. Probably all of us do. Many of us have prophetic words that we have yet to see come into fulfillment. But, you know, and so how do we sometimes need a strategy to get those things? So I just wanted to review um, some of the things that uh, God said prophetically on the Friday night service when Charlie Shamp was with us. And he said that the next 10 years will be the most fruitful for this ministry. Okay? And uh, he also said that um, this is a time of adding Amen. Adding to this body. And I believe that's not only numerically and people that he's bringing. And over the last months, God's just bringing more and more people into this place to be equipped, not just to be people who hear a good sermon. Hopefully you're hearing a good sermon or experience some good worship, but people that are getting equipped for what God has called us to do. There is an adding to this army. And there's also Part of the adding to, and we all get excited when God says, I'm adding to you, right? But generally, the word to us also was that God was giving a, a weight of responsibility to this church because of the call that's on this place. Am I okay on, can you guys hear me? Am I ringing or anything? Okay. So, um, you know, we all get excited about words about adding, but on your job, when you get more responsibility right? Is that a weighty thing? Generally, okay? Uh, because, and it's often because, okay, you've proven yourself faithful in a season, and so God is giving you greater responsibility. Yay! Right? Isn't that part of maturity? Right? When you were a kid, you had far less responsibility than you do at this moment. Wouldn't it great being a kid? Right, but remember, you're you know you didn't have a lot to worry about, and now as you as you age and as you have children and grandchildren and you know all those things, there's a greater weight of responsibility on you because you've matured, and it's the same way in the kingdom. And as the sons and daughters of God are maturing in the earth, that means there is a, a an addition of responsibility that's coming on our lives. So when God says, this is a time of addition, we all like, hallelujah. And then you think about what that means, and you're like, oh my gosh. That means there is a greater weight of responsibility. And it's not just on me. It's not just on Jamie. It's not just on the pastoral team or the teachers in the school. But maturity means that we take on more responsibility. There's a weight. Feel the weight this morning. Right, But there's also the, the reality that um, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He gives the grace to do what he calls you to do. Amen. Another thing that God said through Charlie was that, uh, that those bound by demons and addiction will be set free and added to what God is going to do. Hallelujah. I'm going to say that again. Those that are bound by demons and addiction will are, are going to be set free and added to what God is going to do. Now, again, we get all excited about that until people who are addicted and bound by demons show up. And then we're like, well, what are they doing here? They're causing a problem, right? But, but that's, we forget what God said, and we forget when he says that that's going to happen, that it brings new challenges you know, and, and um, I, I love, I, I should have written it down, what, um, I think it was C.T. Studd who said, I don't want to live um, within a, a yard of chapel, uh, within the sound of a chapel bell, but I want to live within a yard of hell or something like that. That's, that's kind of the gist because, um, you know, 
I pray that God sets us in some of the places where we're the most needed, right? And God wants to move in this neighborhood, and he wants to move in this city, right? And so, but if God's going to set demon, demonized people and addicted people free, that doesn't mean that he's just going to sovereignly do it. Now, he can do that, but generally, who does he do that through? Us, okay? Are you ready to set addicted and demonized people free? It was very quiet, right? Some were like, oh, maybe I don't know. And, you know, and I mean, one of the things that God told me in the early days of the church was that um, the first wave, there would be three waves of people that would come. And the first wave would be people that were the scattered sheep, people who'd been hurt by church and hurt in churches and all that. And then he said there'd be a wave of, the, of addicts that would come. And then he finally said there'd be a wave of those that had been bound by witchcraft that would come in. Amen. Now, I don't know where we are in that process. I mean, that process may take various things. But the thing is, that means we have to prepare for harvest. Amen. And so if we're going to have a real strategy for harvest, we have to be involved in the harvest. Anybody ever bailed hay? Did it? Yeah. Yeah. Did it bail itself? Was it there ripe and ready for somebody to go bail it? Did it demand some work? Did it demand some uncomfortable moments? Right? But there was a harvest that we needed to participate in if we were going to see the fruit of that. Okay? So we have to understand what harvesting means. All right? said also, the, Charlie said, that we would go into the most poverty-stricken areas of the city and people will be set free. I think we're in one. I don't know. You know, God's planted us at this neighborhood at this moment, and there are other places, and I'm not saying this is a bad neighborhood. Uh, God's transforming some things, and there are other areas all throughout the city and this region that God wants to touch. Amen. And, uh, you know, there are moments that I wish I were in a different part of town. Right? But then there are moments I'm like, no, God, you've put me exactly, you've put us exactly where you want us at this moment. Right? And so another thing that Charlie said was, was that this was, and he said many, many things, but he said that um, this is a house of deliverance. Right? And that this is a house where uh, because of the deliverance anointing that's on this house, people are going to get set free. He also said that there was a strong um, anointing of discernment to drive out the witchcraft that's in this city. Okay? And, you know, there, you know before you get a mental picture, there are various degrees and levels of witchcraft. And, and um, I, I think some of the witchcraft that we've battled the most have been Christians operating in charismatic witchcraft. And some of those things, that's a whole other message. But, uh, you know, so don't think of sometimes what you traditionally think of, man. So those are some powerful words, right? But that means if we're a house, and another word that he said was this was a house of revival, there's a revival anointing on this place. But if all those things are coming to manifestation and that God has a, 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 an anointing for deliverance, then that needs to increase in our lives, okay? So let's talk about that for a few minutes, amen? So what does it mean to be a house of deliverance, right? Um, so let's, first of all, let's look at the New Testament foundation of this, okay? Now, I use the, worm, ter, the term deliverance, and if you've been here a while, you understand that term, but just for a, a definition, deliverance refers to setting people free from the influence of evil spirits, or in other words, the casting out of demons, okay? Now, this month in Supernatural School, uh, every month we have a different topic. This month is the School of Deliverance, okay? And we've been leading up to this. We had the School of Inner Healing last month. This, uh, you know, we had a School of Physical Healing. You can't separate physical healing, inner healing, and deliverance. They're all intertwined, right? And uh, um, so, but we'll be focusing on deliverance. So this is kind of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about in the month of January, okay? So, you know, and deliverance can have a lot of different implications. Some people won't even use the term deliverance anymore because it scares people, right? 
And I think there's some wisdom to that because, as in anything, there are excesses. And I know our friend Rodney Hogue, he even uses the term freedom prayer, right? Uh, because sometimes deliverance conjures up images of extreme manifestations and, and uh, people throwing up in buckets and some of those things. And, but we're talking about freedom and people getting set free. That can be not only addressing spirits that are captivating people, but also false mindsets that keep people in bondage, right? Things and cycles of defeat and sin that keep us bound, all of those different things. Now, as we talk about deliverance, I do want to give a little bit of disclaimer, okay? When we're talking about deliverance, that doesn't mean that we can forfeit personal responsibility, right? Because we have responsibility for walking in holiness, right? We have responsibility for realizing that sin is sin and coming out of it, right? And we can't always say, well, I, you know, the devil made me do that, right? No, not really. No matter how bound, there, how much bondage there may be, no matter how much oppression there may be, we have to make choices to walk in holiness, Right? So I just wanted to give that disclaimer. You know, we can't blame everything on the devil. We still have to repent of sin and overcome the flesh. Okay? And, uh, but deliverance can often be an important step in freedom that a lot of times many people don't consider. Okay? And, and much of the church has turned away from a deliverance ministry and having deliverance ministry. But the reality is there is a New Testament pattern and foundation for deliverance and people getting set free. Amen. So in his earthly ministry, Jesus did four things on a regular basis. You know, it was popular a few year, years ago. What would Jesus do? Right? Everybody was carrying the, uh, the you know, the had the bracelets on WWJD and you know and basically it was like it was all about a lot of it was about holiness and being kind but you know the four things that Jesus did he preached he taught he healed the sick and he cast out devils so if you want to walk like Jesus walks you're going to cast some devils out okay now y'all are staying with me so far <laughs> Got a few nervous eyes, right? Don't worry. Uh, stay with me. But um, <laughs> it's just your demons. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but Jesus preached the gospel, but he demonstrated it by healing the sick and casting out demons. So I want to turn to Mark chapter 1 because, as always, I don't think you should just take my word for something. I think we need to be people that, that look at Scripture. Amen. And before you get freaked out, because maybe you've heard or seen some weird things, okay, um, I, I, we're, we're going to address some things this morning, all right? So Mark chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 21, it says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue, he being Jesus, and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes, right? Jesus had a totally different manner, a different character, and he was teaching with great authority. And it says, as just as there, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately the news about him went out everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. So what was one of the things, besides obviously he taught with great authority, but what got everybody's attention? The casting out of a demon, right? In church. 
Hallelujah. And so we see as a result of these things that there was a, a, a cr the news spread quickly. In the next uh, passage, he, he rebukes a fever from Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and she's able to, again, remember, and this is when you're rebuking a fever, this was when a day when nobody had antibiotics. And if you had a fever, you could die. You know, I think we think sometimes when we read that, that's like Jesus, um, like, oh, they've got the flu, or, no, he, he, this could have been a very life-afflicting, um, you know, people used to die from things like the flu, right, because no one could get those things under control, and so Jesus rebukes this, and it leaves so suddenly and so powerfully that she gets up and she starts waiting on everybody. I don't know about you, but when I'm sick, give me some time. Right. Oh, I'm a little flustered. I need to I need to lay here and watch Netflix for a while, right? But she gets up and she waits on him, right? And so then, you know, she's a mom, right? <laughs> so this word spreads about what Jesus did in the synagogue and, and what happens in verse 32. It says, "And when the evening had come after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. Wow. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases, diseases, and diseases, right? And he cast out many demons and was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Amen. So here's this thing that happens in as a result of what Jesus does, the whole city gathers at his door. I tell you what, you start casting some devils out and, and some real freedom, right? Cities will gather at your door, right? Um, you know, if you, Dwayne, I mean, when word gets out, you know, that, uh, that some, Everybody comes, right? It's just what happens, especially if you do things with love, compassion, um, biblically, and not doing it as a spectacle, right? But actually moving with real compassion. And I know, I know Rodney Hoag talks about, and Rodney's a good friend, he teaches a lot on deliverance with uh, Global Awakening, but Rodney says he knows when there's an anointing for deliverance that's present in his life because there's a, an element of compassion that starts coming, right? That's greater than his normal compassion, right? So that's a very important thing when you're talking about deliverance. So here's all this happening with Jesus. And uh, then let's read in Mark um, 1 and reading on in verse 39. I think this is very, an interesting statement. It says, and he went into their synagogue and throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Okay? That kind of summarizes the ministry of Jesus, right? It was as common for Jesus to cast out demons as it was for him to preach a sermon. Okay? And um, it was a normal part of the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached. Okay. Isn't this such a great sermon, the Sunday after Christmas? Yeah, nobody, nobody's like, the Sunday after Christmas, let's talk about demons, right? <laughs> but it's a sh <laughs> if you've been with family, you know that it's necessary. <laughs> Just saying, right? <laughs> right. So... <laughs> So let's talk for just a minute because this really is, now it's not so controversial here because we have a foundation of it, okay? But it, uh, it, it is important to understand that there are obstacles to deliverance that we need to remove from our understanding, right, from the church today. And uh, first of all, one of our biggest obstacles when we start dealing with stuff like this is ignorance, and ignorance just means you just don't know, okay? And so, you know, one of the things people will get like, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I, I, do, do they, do, can demons really affect Christians? 
Yes. Um, and sometimes Christians actually get targeted more. Okay? And so um, people would ask John Wimber. He said people can constantly ask if Christians ca can have demons. And my response is usually, sure, we find them there all the time. <laughs> right? And, uh, and <laughs> hell has a very well-practiced strategy. And it's called denial to keep people in bondage, okay? And, and really, deception is a strategy. Denial and deception, those are strategies that, that work well. And demons are really good at it, right? So, Father, I thank you for your anointing today, right? I thank you that you're opening our hearts to receive truth, and, uh, Father, thank you for your presence, Father, that deals with deception even this morning, Lord. And just every spirit of unbelief, I just command you to go right now, right? So I'll give a quick testimony before I go into the rest of this. Um, when I was a teenager living here in Ardmore, um, there was a church that started um, moving in deliverance. And I'm not sure that they did everything right. But in the 80s, we were all learning a lot, right? And um, I had a, a, I was going to a Southern Baptist church here in town. And lo and behold, my youth pastor got, and his wife got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, it caused, it was like a, someone had kicked a hornet's nest because uh, there was so much happening from that in our, our Baptist church. Now, you know, much of what was happening in this church was causing a stir. And so um, I went to college at Oklahoma Baptist University. I was a very good Baptist boy. Um, my youth pastors, and I, I just say that because I have great respect for the Southern Baptist Church, uh, great respect for... Uh, what they've attained and what they've done. Pray for them as they are facing many challenging days, just like all of the body of Christ at this moment. But um, I went to Oklahoma Baptist University. My roommate and I were from the same church, and um, our youth pastor and his wife had moved to Midwest City, um, just about a 30-minute drive away from where we were, and they invited us to come over, and um, my my roommate was very close to them, and uh, Three of us from that same church were all going to Oklahoma Baptist University. And so one evening, we drove over to visit my youth pastor and his wife. And um, I was very curious, but very cautious, right? Because I'd been warned, stay away from them. I'd been warned not to pray in tongues because that was from the devil. Um, I'd warned that people were being brainwashed and all this kind of stuff. And so we went over and um, went in. And as we went in and sat down, and my youth pastor and his wife were just sharing their testimony. And I began to get really, really, really uncomfortable in a very unusual way. I don't think I've ever told you about this, maybe a, a long time ago. Um, and I, you know, and, I, and there's a reason I'm telling this because when we talk about deliverance and some of those things, we think of witchcraft and, you know, really deep, dark, all this stuff and immorality and all those things. But I, I, I was, as I was sitting there, I began to tremble and shake. And not because I was nervous, it was a very uncommon trembling and shaking. And I'm sitting there, and I, as we're around the table, and I, I looked at everybody and said, I don't know what's happening to me. And they did, right, because something was manifesting. And no one was addressing it. No one was speaking to anything. Um, but, and they just simply looked at me and said, in the name of Jesus, you leave Andy alone, and you leave right now. And something left. And my um, questions about deliverance and my unbelief about deliverance suddenly left with it. Now, my questions didn't. But I suddenly realized that there was something of unbelief that was on my life, right? And sometimes 
one of the things that we will often deal with when we're dealing with deliverance, whether it comes through teaching or speaking to things, unbelief is a really, really big one. Right? And it's probably one of the biggest demonic deceptions in the church today. And we've been taught many times to not believe things, but we get bound by demonic unbelief, right? And it will often keep people from getting saved. It will keep people um, from getting free from dead churches. It will keep people bound and not believing in healing or the gifts of the Spirit because the devil really, really, really is good at deception, right? And um, I just want to read out of 1 Timothy. Let me look. I think it's 1 Timothy 4.1. Let's read that together. And it's funny because the devil keeps using the same deceptions over and over throughout history. They may have different names. They may come through different sources. But some of the things that the church is dealing with in heresies right now, they're old heresies. They just have new names. Okay? So 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to what? Deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, right? And so some of the things that are really warring against the church uh, are designed to keep Christians in bondage or to keep people who are close to believing from not only getting saved, but if they do get saved, from getting free. Right, And there are doctrines of demons right now. And I, I'd say two of the biggest ones in the church right now are universalism, the belief that we're all saved, and that no one has to make a personal commitment or relationship to Jesus. That is a huge demonic deception. And yet the other one is cessationism, that the gifts of the Spirit, that miracles and all those things have ceased. Because, first of all, if the devil can keep you in bondage and you're not moving in power, then the gospel is ineffective in your life. There's a certain amount of effectiveness, but it could be more effective. And then on the other end, if he can keep everybody convinced that no one has to make a personal choice, that we're all saved because of what Jesus has done, that's as big of a deception that's leading people to eternal torment. Right, and there's those are two huge deceptions in the church right now, and, and one you know, and then again you know, if we do get saved, the enemy tries to keep us bound, not believing that we're, there's a problem that we need to deal with the demonic. Right now, sometimes it's as simple, and if you were in inner healing last month, and or if you've been in our healing in the class in the past, you understand that as we learn to get healed, as we learn to get rid of trauma, as we learn to close doors, as we learn to forgive, many times those demonic issues in our life, we get set free, and those things leave, all right? But then sometimes there are things that hang on because they don't like to go, and they look for legal rights to stay, Right, and then sometimes you do have to address things. I mean, this morning it was really strange because when we were in worship, I just was like, Oh, death, you've been overcome. Death, you've been overcome. And I felt something of his, of his anointing and his presence striking a spirit of death this morning. I mean, I felt that. I felt the authority of the king, the authority of the lamb, moving against the power of death. Amen. So we just declare that today, not only in our body, but we're an intercessory people. So we declare that even over this city, over the city that the power of death is being broken, that power of death that's in the east, I thank you, Lord. I ask that you judge that and you bring that down, that thing that stood in the east, and has brought death to, to people, that's brought a death assignment, that's tried to even bring a death assignment to that whole region, and anything that happens there, Father, I ask that you just extend your hand right now, and Lord, that you begin to deal with that. Father God, I thank you that it's you 
that move in authority. And Lord, I just thank you. We ask that you deal with that power. Lord, I thank you that you're, you've given us the keys to the kingdom, a kingdom of life and power and joy and victory. So Father, we thank you today. And Lord, I thank you that we're hidden in you, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Father God, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and you hide us in the shadow and the shelter of your wings. So, hallelujah. You notice I just didn't go ramshackle against something, binding something up. Like we're asking the Lord to deal with that. Okay. Uh, you know, um, just don't go blindly up against a principality and a power. Right. You may sense the Lord doing something. We agree with what the Lord wants to do. Let him do it. Right. And we partner with him. Uh, but just be careful about how you go against something like that. Right. Hallelujah. That's just a whole side note. But I just uh, he, he I just sense his hand uh, uh, moving and uh, the Lord doing something. So hallelujah. So we can be in ignorance uh, uh, of what the Lord wants to do. I was ignorant as an 18-year-old college Baptist college student that I had a spirit of unbelief. But then the Lord showed up, right? And there was a little bit of a manifestation, but they didn't allow it, right? And that thing lifted off me, and I was suddenly like, oh, I believe that this is real, and, you know, sometimes something happens and we're like, I'm not sure that I have the theology for this. And then you start reading the Bible and you're like, oh, my gosh, my experience matches some theology. Right? But, you know, so we have to be careful in all those, uh, all those things of what the Lord shows us. So ignorance. Then there's fear. There's, I don't think there's any other ministry that is as fearful as this. Right, because of the unknown, but and a lot of it. Let's just be honest. It comes because people often see extremes that some that some ministers operate in, and fear those types of deliverance ministry, and they probably should. Right, um, there there are two approaches to deliverance. Okay, I want to give some understanding here, um, and a lot of times when we read stuff like we just read in Mark, or you read the Book of Acts, and you see. Um, people manifest and all this kind of stuff. You've got to remember that in the book of Acts and in the gospel, Jesus was bringing the kingdom into a territory where it, it had never been before. And there were, there were uh, sorcerers opposing him uh, in the church. There were these types of things happening, and as the kingdom was coming in, it was causing a, a clashing of kingdoms. It was a very combative style. Okay, if you, if you went probably with Roland and Heidi Baker on an outreach in Mozambique, and they went into a village where the gospel had never gone, and the witch doctor met them, at the, and they're bringing in the kingdom, there would probably be some manifestations, right? Because when you're bringing the kingdom into places where it's not been, there is a clashing. Now, that is totally different when you're cleaning up someone who's saved. Right. It, it is a gentler, um, not that some of those things can't happen, you know. Sometimes we, what happens um, when, things, when there are manifestations, it's because we expect manifestations. And we actually stir up manifestations. And uh, I can remember again, I'm being very transparent this morning, is that Okay. Uh, years ago, as a, uh, uh, my second year in college, when I was going to a, after what I experienced, I was going to a spirit-filled Baptist church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, right? They do exist. And uh, I went to a couple in the church that did deliverance ministry because I was having crazy stuff happening to me, even though I'd had a deliverance experience. And um, uh, so here I am, and I walk in and, um, to this elderly couple, and I'm sitting with them. And I started to tremble again. And the husband just looked at me and he said, we don't allow that. And that thing that was wanting to manifest stopped. <laughs> and then I had a very peaceful time of ministry and got really set free from some stuff, right? But just casually, when something started to manifest and he just said, we don't allow that. His authority 
the authority of the Christ in him quieted that thing that was, was trying to grip and bind me, right? So um, when we're ministering to believers, when we're ministering to the sheep, we move in compassion, right? And it's cleaning people up, and it's kinder and gentler, unless we have some issues in our life that we refuse to deal with, right? And that's a whole nother sermon, right? <laughs> but uh, when a person is in the kingdom, this, this setting free is going to be very different. It's a, it's a cleaning up. And another thing that's very imp- a big difference between combative deliverance of something breaking into a territory and deliverance and inner healing in the church is we are teaching people to be participants and not spectators, right? Because if you've ever done any inner healing or deliverance with someone, one of the quickest things that you must teach them and get them to understand, unless they learn to be responsible for their personal freedom and walk it out, they won't stay free. And a lot of times, deliverance becomes a problem when people become dependent on a deliverance minister and they don't take personal responsibility in, in their life, right? So p- part of the deliverance process, when, when you get break a, a, the power of a spirit that's been gripping someone and you bring them into freedom, that's really only the beginning. True, Dwayne? Then you have to teach people to walk in freedom, Because aftercare is as important as the very ministry of deliverance. How many of you have had a baby in here? Right? (laughs) Will raised his hand, right? (laughs) As important as childbirth is, and you're like, oh, I delivered that thing. Is aftercare important? Yeah, you have decades decades of aftercare ideally 18 to 20 years sometimes 30 40 50 60 I don't know right but when you birth a child aftercare is as important as the physical act right because if you don't care for the child everything that you've gained is lost deliverance is the same way and so in America when we're because here's the thing if there's an anointing for deliverance on this house first of all we have to get free because if you're you can't get someone free from something that you're bound in because if you try it you're probably going to have an interesting experience all right so the first step is to say okay we have to be people that get free and we all need freedom all of us right I'm giving testimonies today because I I want you to realize that deliverance isn't just for the really messed up cases (laughs) maybe some of you think I'm really messed up maybe I am right but there there are times in in our lives when we need ministry and, you know, one of the greatest reasons I think Bethel ha- Church in Reading continues to be a house of revival and breakthrough is because every year, every couple of years, their staff goes through some inner healing, right? And, and it keeps their staff healthy, right? It, it cuts down on conflict and strife because when you're not healthy, you'll walk in conflict and strife, right? Right? And so we all, so first of all, the thing is, we've all got to get free, all right? So I just want to challenge all of us for the upcoming year, and I'm not done with my sermon, y'all don't get excited. I've preached shorter the last two Sundays so that I could go a lot longer today, all right? I've been telling Jamie, I can go to 1230 today, (laughs) and she said no. She said, nobody wants that, right? So, so first of all, um, <laughs> there are no rollover minutes. Good grief. Well, there are today, right? It's a new day and a new year and a new model. That's all I'm going to say, right? <laughs> it's this close, right? We're stepping in early. We're forerunners, right? 
So first of all, if you have an issue, there, there's really no reason to be ashamed. Because the next part is after um, ignorance and fear, one of the things that the church deals with this ministry that they don't want to move into it is because of stigma. Right? But we all have stuff. Right? And we all need care and ministry to get free. And, you know, um, people have had this thought that if you need deliverance, it's alarming, it's embarrassing, it's shameful. Or if you come from a cessationist background, that it's primitive, it's foolish, it's superstitious, um, but it's, it's very biblical. And, you know, it's really interesting because in the New Testament, people talk about deliverance very, very openly. And I even, you know, even in uh, um, Luke 8, 2, where they're talking about Mary Magdalene, they say, whom seven spirits were cast out of. Right? L like it's not a big deal. Right? Like if today I said, oh, everybody, you know, um, <laughs> I know I'm being very careful. Just like, here's, here's Jamie Rudd, whom three spirits were cast out of. She's with us today. Right? <laughs> you know, how weird would that be? But that's kind of what they said. Well, this Mary Magdalene, they cast seven devils out of her, you know. There's no stigma, right? Now, you know, again, when you're doing deliverance ministry, it's very important that you guard and protect a, per a person's privacy, right? But in the New Testament, they're like, hey, this is no big deal, okay? Let's also look at Luke um, uh, Luke 8.10, which is what I just read, but let's read that, I think. No, it's actually a different passage. Yeah, it's Mary Magdalene. It's talking about some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. They just group deliverance and healing together, even though they're different here are these people who've been healed of evil spirits, and they were especially women, right, and sicknesses. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm seeing if y'all are paying attention. And Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Right? So they just act like it's no big deal. And then what about Luke 13? And we'll just make reference to that. Um, the, the lady who had the spirit of infirmity. Right? And it had caused her, I can't remember if that's the one where she was bent over or she had the issue of blood. Somebody can look it up and tell me. But um, they call her a daughter of Abraham. Right? Here's this daughter of Abraham, someone who's not foreign to the covenants of promise. And Satan's had her bound. Sometimes even sicknesses, physical afflictions, uh, those can be caused by spirits of infirmity right? I mean, you can, you know, and sometimes when you, we, we think of like the passage in where it talks about legion in the book of Mark, where, what's your name? I, well, my name's legion for there are many of us, all right? When we think of deliverance, we think of that passage, but really, you know, here's this woman in Luke, in um, the Luke 13 passage who seems to pretty much have it together, except she's bound by infirmity, Right? It can be something as simple as that. And yet, Jesus wants people bound with a spirit of infirmity to be free. Right? And, and that's what happens many times when you're wanting to move in healing ministry. You know, because here's what I found no one really wants to honestly say, Man, I want to be a deliverance minister. I rarely see that. What happens a lot of times is people are like, man, I want to pray for the sick, and I want to see them get healed. And when you start praying for the sick, what happens? You start running into demons, right? You start running into critters, and, and you know, you find yourself being dragged into deliverance ministry. The good news is, you guys have, we have authority over them. We have authority, but we also need to experience healing. So here's my challenge to us. Understand that there's not a stigma to needing deliverance or healing. Right? 
There's just not. And if you need it, if you're sick in an area, get healthy. There's no shame in that, right? And so I encourage you, if you need deliverance, right, get it. If you need inner healing, get it. And then the second thing, if we're to be a house of deliverance and there's a harvest that's coming in, you know what? If we have multitudes of people who need deliverance, Dwayne and Shelley can't do it all. Jamie and I can't do it all, right? That means that, hello, this is the day of the saints when your basic equipment as a believer is to set people free. Now, a lot of people run from that because it means that we have to clean our junk up, right? That we have to be healthy. But if harvest is coming, like the prophets say it's coming, right? And we're beginning to see things happen like celebrities getting born again. I mean, you know, reports, we've seen what's happened with Kanye, right? Justin Bieber, what's, he's further coming into some understanding. I read about a, um, a uh, Victoria's Secret model who, who's gotten saved. I mean, there's something happening that's going to have a trickle down effect where it's not just Hollywood, but when Ardmore, Oklahoma. Right? But that means that we have to be people that go and bail the hay. And it may be challenging. <laughs> you may be, get sweaty and dirty. It may wear you out. Now, thank God, God's giving us some revelation where it's going faster and easier, right? And our knowledge is increasing. But that means that we as believers have to be those that are equipped to not only go into the harvest, not only go and catch the fish, but what happens after you catch the fish? You got to clean them. Right? So if we believe in harvest, my challenge to you is that that anointing for deliverance in our lives has to increase. The Lord has said that we are a house of deliverance. I've been sensing for months, just even for my own life, and I'll be honest, I don't really like to do deliverance. I don't like it. Um, it's it's um, challenging. It takes time. Um, one of the most heartbreaking things I, I see is when you do deliverance with someone and they go back into things that kept them bound. That's really difficult, right? It's really heartbreaking. That's the part of the ministry that we all need to understand, that when people walk away from freedom, it's difficult, right? And you've seen the Lord invest in people, and so there's risk. But you know what? There's always risk in ministry. There's always risk in loving people. Right? There's always risk in getting in the trenches with people, right? You, you, you learn to do it with love, and you learn to do it with boundaries, but you have to do it, right? So if we're going to go into this harvest, there's a call for every one of us to step into this. Hallelujah. So, If you want to know more, come to Supernatural School, right? This really isn't just a big commercial for it, but, but and many of you have been through it, right? But, but there, there is a weight of responsibility that is on us as believers. I don't know about you guys. I want to be a biblical believer. I, I want to be a biblical believer. I don't want to be a believer that, and I'm, how I say this carefully is, how American Christianity at this moment is defining Christianity. And I think there, we're further in a moment where um, there, there's a separation upon us. 
where we have to determine as believers, as the church in this nation, are we really going to pursue the things of God or are we going to be entertained on a Sunday morning? Right? So I challenge you today as a house of deliverance. Let's get free and let's get equipped to set people free. Amen? Let's stand this morning. Father, I just want to thank you today for the harvest. Lord, you said to lift up our eyes and to look. Look all around us because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so, Father, I thank you today. First of all, I just pray right now that you just release an anointing to set people free. Father, that you would just set us free. Areas even where we're in self-denial or areas where we try to hide. Lord, not out of conviction or condemnation, not out of condemnation, but out of conviction. But because, God, you want us free. Because you love us. And so I pray even now that you just extend your hand. Holy Spirit, I ask you to move. Come, Holy Spirit, and begin to set people free. And even begin to highlight areas where we need to be free. Again, not to condemn anyone, but Lord, because you love us and you want us healthy. And Father, I ask as well, Lord, that you begin to touch people, Holy Spirit, right now, that you begin to call them, those that you've set aside especially, and we all have different calls, but Lord, we all, you've all given us the basic equipment for dealing with the demonic but, Father, I ask that you even begin to touch those and call those, even if you have to do it dragging and screaming, dragging them into this ministry. Father God, that you're going to clean up in the harvest. Father, you're going to set people free. You're going to deliver them. You're going to bring them into maturity. And, Father, I thank you that there's an anointing for this even to, to accelerate people's lives. Father, that people won't have to come in and struggle for months or years with stuff, but they're going to get set free, and there's going to be great fruitfulness. I, Lord, I just declare that anointing of acceleration. Father, even on people's lives that are here today, Father, some that have struggled, Lord, I ask that you just set them free this morning. Father, that you break off those bondages and those things, those even belief systems, Father God, that have kept people in bondage. So, Father, I thank you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the multitude of things that you're doing in people's lives. I just sense your work and your ministry today. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that you're setting people free. And, Father, there's just a, a season of people being set free. People getting saved and people coming out of bondages. Father God, I thank you for what you're going to do. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come today. Father, I pray that even where, there have been, uh, where there's been unbelief on people, that you would just lift off right now. Spirit of unbelief, I command you to go right now. Any spirit of doubt and unbelief that's kept people in bondage, I command you to go. And you come off their minds right now. You come off the back of their necks right now in Jesus' name. All that witchcraft that's tried to, tried to mark people, even some that have not been in any type of witchcraft, it's tried to mark them and hold them in. And so I command you to loose people right now in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And people are being set free today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that your kingdom is present and increasing in all of our lives today. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for victory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. I feel a real freedom in the atmosphere. Wow. I just really sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and I think he's just, just come in in a new way. Not that he wasn't already here, but there's just a different anointing 
that I sense really, really coming. And even in worship, there was just something about halfway through worship that just started coming in a different way. And so new season, new moment, there's a, just a real freedom that's coming. And I just hear shouts of joy coming forth in this city as people are going to get delivered. I hear it by the Spirit coming in a greater measure. So praise God. Now, if you need ministry, we'll have a prophetic team here today. If you need um, some physical healing prayer, we'll have a team here. If you're like, I need some inner healing, I need some deliverance, then I encourage you to call the church this week, um, talk to Shelly, and next week, you can leave a message. We'll check messages, right? If you've had these things for a long time, you can go another week longer. Um, <laughs> Right? And uh, <laughs> Shelly will call you back. <laughs> no supernatural school will resume next month. And no, s- next, which is next month. And um, no Christian school. Uh, and have a good week and a happy new year. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great day.